What a subject to preach on, eh? The victory of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. The Apostle Paul says, Thanks be unto God, who always gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, I, I want to begin in a really negative sense to come on to the positive sense. But I, I really believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, and most of us, if not all of us here, are followers of Christ today, God does not want us to go through life downtrodden and defeated. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. He wants us to have victory in every single area of our lives. Victory over sin, Victory over Satan. But un unfortunately, and this is the negative note, a lot of followers of Christ don't live like that. They don't seem to know anything of this abundant life that Jesus said we would have. I have come that you might have life, and life in all of its abundance. It is God's express will and purpose for every single one of us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we live our lives in victory. So what a subject we have this morning in this Christ Alone series to look at. Christ, our victory. And I believe this morning the Lord wants every one of us, no matter how much we know this, but He wants us afresh to behold the victory that Jesus Christ as obtained for every one of us. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, friends, Jesus Christ has obtained the victory for you. Amen? Hallelujah. His victory can now become our victory. His victory that he, he, he had can become the victory of every child of God. The Bible says, as he is, or as he was, so are we in this present world. So as he was, he lived his life in complete victory. The whole of his life he lived in victory over sin and death and even hell. He was victorious in life and he was victorious in death. Hallelujah. God has no intention of allowing us to lose the battle of life. He wants us to be in a place, friends, where we're on the winning side. He wants us to have that attitude. Now, a lot of us know, in fact, all of us know, we're not always on the winning side. Can you put your hand up if you can say amen to that? I see those hands. We're not always on the winning side. But I really believe that God wants us to have the attitude that when we blow it and when we miss it, we can say in the face of Satan, do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise again. We might be down, but we're not out. And even though we miss it at times and we, we get into a, a, into a place of defeat, God wants us to rise again. You know the, the Rocky, the boxing champion? The films of Rocky Bill Bauer, you know his secret of victory? He didn't know what it was to lie down. When he got knocked down, he got, knocked, got, he got back up again. Just when everybody thought he was out, he rallied again. Friends, God wants you to be a winner. Amen? Just turn to someone and say, God wants me to be a winner. If you've got nobody sitting next to you, say to the seat. <laughs> Hallelujah. Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He says, thanks be unto God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice here, friends, we don't have to earn victory. The Bible says this victory is something that God gives us. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory. The salvation 
that we have and the victory that we have in Christ is a free gift of God's grace and it's given to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. That means if we don't have to earn the victory, we already have the victory. You do not have to earn any victory. All you have to do is to appropriate the victory that we've already got. For all God's promises, the Bible says, are yes and are men in Christ. So as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we may boldly proclaim we have victory in Jesus. This is something that we can give God thanks for. The Bible says, thanks be unto God, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul, writing to the Roman church, he declares that nothing that life throws at him is able to separate him from the love of God that is in Christ. And nothing can separate him from living a victorious Christian life. Romans 8 verse 37 says, Now in all these things, everything that life has thrown at us, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This word conquerors here, it describes um, one who is super victorious. Not just victorious, but super victorious who wins more than an ordinary victory, but is overpowering in achieving victory. He is more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. More than a conqueror. Now thanks be unto God, Paul writes to Corinth. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. I, I've been amazed as I've been studying the this subject this week and look through the letters that Paul sent to the different churches. Friends, every single one of them nearly, Paul is talking about this victory. He's talking about the conquest. He's talking about the life of victory that believers can be living. It's not just an isolated scripture when it talks about God giving us the victory. In nearly all Paul's letters, He's, he's, he's spelling this out. And I want you to notice that Paul is using words describing victory of Roman co connotation. He's using the word victory. He's using the word triumph. He's using the word conquerors. Now everybody knew in that day what these words meant. Victory, triumph, conquest. A victory was won on the field of battle. When the battle was engaged, one would leave the battlefield a victor and the other would be conquered. A triumph was a spectacular victory. It was a spectacular victory parade of the victory that had been won on the battlefield. It usually happened and took place through the streets of Rome. When a victory was won on the battlefield, the conquering general would have a triumph in Rome. And he would lead the triumphant army, his, his men. He would lead his, his, his triumphant army through the streets of Rome. In triumph. Following on from his men, there would be the kings or the leading generals of the conquered army, every one of them in chains. Then there would be hundreds or thousands of prisoners in chains who had been in the opposing army. They would come next. So from the kings and the generals of a defeated army, they would come. And then the elderly people, 
Those who hadn't been to battle but had been conquered because their armies had been conquered, they would come. And then the children would come. And the mothers would come. All of them in shame and defeat. And the conqueror would ride in front of them with his army to say, we have conquered all this. Then would come wagon load after wagon load after wagon load of all the spoils that had been taken from those who had been conquered. So these words, victory, was won on the battlefield, but a triumph was the victory celebration and parade of the conquering soldiers, of the, of, the, of the conquering general. Paul, writing to the church at Colossae, chapter 2, verse 15, he speaks of Christ's victory on the cross. Listen to how he describes it. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, or triumphing over the... Or, Triumphing, triumphing over them in it. He was talking about the cross. Can you get a picture of what Paul's saying here? The victory was won at Calvary, the battlefield. But there was a parade that took place. And principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them. Another version of this, another uh, translation of this, it says, He defeated the rulers and powers of the spiritual world with the cross. He won the victory over them. And he led them away as defeated and powerless, prisoners for the world to see. Another version says, There Christ defeated all powers and forces. He let the whole world see them being led away as prisoners when he celebrated his victory. Hallelujah. Do you get the picture? Do you get the picture of what the Holy Ghost is trying to say this morning, friends? The victory took place at the cross. Hallelujah. God was in Christ, the Bible says, reconciling the world to himself. At the cross, Jesus won a mighty victory. He disarmed principalities and powers. He led them away as defeated and powerless prisoners for the world to see. And he wants us to see it this morning. Friends, Satan and his hosts are already defeated. Hallelujah. Already defeated. They are not going to be one day defeated. They are already defeated. Publicly shamed. Shamed and made a spectacle of. Like a triumphant general displaying his captives in a victory parade. So the risen Christ now displays principalities and powers as a defeated foe. Satan and the forces of darkness are defeated. Through the cross and the power of the cross, already defeated. Friends, what God did for the world at that place that we know as Calvary, in the Greek, Hebrew, the word Golgotha, what God did there at that place was absolutely amazing. At that place we used to sing called Calvary. One day Napoleon Bonaparte, he stood with his generals, his leading generals, and displayed on a, a, a table in front of them was a map of the entire world. And Bonaparte with his generals were looking at the con conquest that they had made all over the world. And he pointed with sadness in his voice to where our nation was. And he said, if it had not been for that little red dot, 
I would have conquered the world. Hallelujah. Friends, if it had not been for that place called Calvary, Satan would have conquered the world. But thank God for Calvary. Hallelujah. It was at Calvary that Satan met his Waterloo. Waterloo. It was at Calvary he was utterly, wonderfully, powerfully defeated. The greatest victory of all time was accomplished there. In this current series that we're having of Christ alone, we've looked at the uniqueness of Christ. I think it was Alan who spoke on that subject. Was it Alan? You spoke on the uniqueness of Christ. And Alan shared with us about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was very God. And yet, he was very man as well as very God. And for 33 years, he lived in a human body. As a man, he knew what it was to be tempted and tested in all points like we. He felt every emotion that we feel. He felt every pain. He knew what sorrow was. He knew what rejection was. He knew what it was to be tired. He knew what it was to be hungry. He knew what it was to weep. He knew what it was to laugh. Every emotion, he felt it. He lived it. The Bible says we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. But he was in all points tempted and tested like we are. Yet he was without sin. After his baptism by John and the coming of the Holy Spirit upon him in the River Jordan, the Bible says he was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days and 40 nights, he, he never ate anything or he never drank anything. It was a supernatural fast. And after those days were ended, the Bible says Satan came to him. Friends, he didn't come to him when he was, first went into the wilderness in the power of the Spirit because he just received a mighty baptism at Jordan. The fullness of God came upon him. It says after those 40 days had finished, it was then that Satan came to him. Let me tell you, he will always come to you at your weakest. He will always come to the vulnerable areas of your life and mine. And there in the wilderness, Jesus faced mankind's greatest enemies. The world, the flesh, and Satan himself. The Bible says the world is the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. And Satan said... He showed him, the Bible says, in a moment of time, all the kingdoms of this world. And said, all these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus replied, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. He handed to his fleshly desires if you were the son of God turn that stone into bread you know how hungry you are it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word friends I don't think this was just a, a, two, a you know a line that we've got here I think this, this was real temptation this would go on for a long while it is written, man will not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. And said, throw yourself down. It's written, he'll give his angels charge over you to keep. Let me tell you, the devil knows the Bible. But he twists it. Has God really said? He'll give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Jesus said... It is written, 
you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Let me tell you, friends, that temptation he faced in the wilderness. The Bible says after it was over, angels came and ministered to him. It was, it was difficult, but he came through it. Let me tell you, friends, the victory wasn't only won when Jesus died on the cross. The victory was won in the days of his flesh. The Bible says the devil left him for a little while after this. But it was only for a little while he faced further temptation and testing through his life, through his earthly ministry. It was only for a little while. And the devil came back again and again at him. In Gethsemane it happened again. He faced the onslaught of the enemy. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But there, in his earthly ministry, Jesus Christ faced the devil. He faced the temptations of the world. He faced the temptations of the flesh. And the Bible says he was without sin. And the ultimate victory. Friends, when Satan left him for a little while, he kept coming back to him. But let me tell you, after Calvary, he's never come back to him again. Hallelujah! He's never, ever come back to him again because Calvary was the ultimate victory over principalities and powers. On the eve of his crucifixion, he said, the prince of this world comes. He can find nothing in me. Nothing to put his dirty hands on. Nothing to accuse me of. He can find nothing in me. We sing that song, don't we? In him, no sin is found. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 22, who did no sin, nor neither was deceit found in his mouth. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. The Lamb of God, holy, spotless, pure. Hallelujah. In him no sin is found. And when he hung upon the cross, the sins of the whole world were laid upon him. The Bible says he bore our sin and, his, and our sickness on the tree. Not only our sins, but our sicknesses. He bore them on the tree. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you have been healed. When Jesus hung upon the cross, he took upon himself the curse for all of our wrongdoing. Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The law said this, cursed is everybody who hangs upon a tree. Jesus knew the, what the law meant. There was curses on those who hung upon a tree. But Jesus said he took the curse for us. The Word of God says there, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Jesus wanted to redeem us from the curse of the law. So he went to the cross and he took all of our curses so that we could now take his blessings. Hallelujah. The curse of sin. The curse of sickness. The curse of depression. The curse of anxiety. The curse of fear. The curse of addictions. Even the curse of death. The curse of hell. Friends, they were all laid upon him when he hung upon the cross. No wonder we sing that song, the cross has said it all. The cross has said it all. The moment we received Jesus, 
whether we believe this or not, every curse in our life was destroyed. Hallelujah. The moment we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, every curse in our life was destroyed. What glorious victory, friends, we can now live in. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul was all, he almost despaired at times because of the struggles that he had in this life. Life threw at the Apostle Paul some curved balls. You read the list there of the things that he went through. And of course he knew about them because the Lord had told Ananias when he went to lay hands on him in that street called Straight in the house of Simon. He said, show, I'll show him out what he's got to suffer for my sake. And Paul faced some some very tri great trials and hardships and difficulties as he, he went through life, including the battle that he faced in his own flesh. You know, friends, that's one of our biggest battles, the battles that we have with self, the battles that we have in our own, own flesh, our, our fallen nature. Paul, what, what did he say? The good that I want to do? I don't do it. I see another law working in my members. So the, the, the evil that I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. He knew what it was, friends, to battle with his flesh. He knew what it was to go through the, the, the trials of, of his flesh. No wonder he said, in my flesh dwells nothing good. Let me tell you, in your flesh, in my flesh, there's nothing good. It's fallen human nature. And friends, the, the heart is the most deceitful thing there is and is desperately wicked. No wonder Paul cried out, Who will deliver me from the body of this death? He realized where the victory was. He realized what Jesus had done upon the cross. And so he declares after making that statement, Who's going to set me free from this body of death? This flesh life in me that wars against my spirit. He looked to the cross and he said, Thank God, through Jesus Christ, I have the victory. Hallelujah. Friends, the victory has already been accomplished in Christ. The testings, the trials, the temptations that we face, the Bible says they are common to man. There's nothing you are going through that's not common to man. There's nothing I'm going through. But the Bible says God is faithful, who will, with the trials and the testings that come, He will make a way of escape so that we can stand up in them. Hallelujah. So we'll not bow down to them. So that we'll come out of them victorious in Christ. Can I say something, friends? There is not one sin that besets you at this moment in time. There is not one addiction. There is not one, there, there, there is not one, one thing that comes upon your life as a believer. But we can have victory in every one of them. You need to hear that again. You can have victory in every trial that you go through. You can have victory in every temptation that you face. I can have victory too. In everything that we are going through in, in this life, friends, we can have victory. Hallelujah. Because he overcame, the Bible says. We will overcome also. Even in this area, up here, where the battle takes place, the mind, the battleground. The Bible says we've got to have the mind of Christ. And when the fiery darts begin to come at our minds, we put on the helmet of salvation. We heard that somewhere this week. I don't know where it was now, but we put on the helmet of salvation. Hallelujah. We protect our minds. And the Bible says we pull down arguments. We pull down strongholds. Hallelujah. We take authority in this area. Friends, even our minds can come under the control of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. 
the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of every stronghold. Hallelujah. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory, eh? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. No wonder Paul said, we are more than conquerors. In every battle, we are more than a conqueror through Christ who loves us. Friends, his victory can now become our victory. But we've got to make it our own. We've got to appropriate the victory that's already won. We have to choose to live in victory. Amen? We have to choose to live in the victory that Christ has obtained for us. Pilate examined him. He said, I find no fault in this man. Satan examined him. The prince of this world comes. He searches, but he can't find anything in me. Man examined him. Satan examined him. And nobody could accuse Jesus of sin. You know why he was put on the cross? Because of blasphemy. That's why they crucified him. Because he said, I'm the son of God. I'm God in the flesh. And they said he's blaspheming. He was telling the truth, wasn't he? But that's why they put him on the cross. All the trumped up charges that they'd hired people to get, they, they just fell to the ground. But it was this one thing of blasphemy that they put him on the cross. And at the cross, at that place called Calvary, all the hosts of hell, they were gathered there. Friends, understand something. Every principality and power, every demon was at that place that day. To destroy the Prince of Peace. And for three hours, the Bible says there was darkness over the land. Three hours from 12 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was pitch black. As he was put to the sword. As powers of darkness came upon him. As the sin of the whole world was laid upon him. And out of that darkness at three o'clock in the afternoon, there came a piercing cry. The Bible says he cried with a loud voice. Let me tell you, friends, it was a victory cry. It wasn't a cry of defeat. It was a victory cry. It is finished. It's accomplished. Hallelujah. It is finished. What I have come to accomplish, it is accomplished. It's all paid in full. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The price for my redemption, for your redemption, for mankind's redemption had been made. And at that moment, all the legal rights that Satan held over the human race, at that moment... They were broken. The first Adam had messed it up and gave legal rights to Satan. But when the second Adam came, hallelujah, he claimed back what the first Adam had lost. Glory to God. Satan's hold was forever broken. Principalities and powers were destroyed. The Bible says he triumphed over them by his death on the cross. And the Bible says after he had cried out with a loud voice, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When a person dies, they're not dead until the spirit departs the body. So at death, Something must take place. This week it's been on the news. I don't know if you... Was it Friday? About that young 14-year-old girl who's been frozen. Hoping that one day there'll be a cure for cancer. 
and uh, she'd be brought back to life. Let me tell you, friends, it's absolutely impossible. Impossible. She's paid thousands and thousands of pounds for it. How desperate people are. You see, once the spirit has left the body, the body is dead. It's your spirit that's keeping you alive. One day, our spirits will leave our bodies. And that's what happened to Jesus. The Bible says his spirit departed from his body. And because it was the preparation for the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they went to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. Permission was granted, and so they took the body down, and they anointed the body for burial, putting into the linen cloths that wrapped that body round. It was about 100 pounds of spices, the Bible says. 100 pounds in weight, wrapping the body and then carrying it into the chamber of this new tomb. It was a new tomb because nobody had ever slept in it or nobody had been put in, nobody had been put in it. It belonged, the Bible says, to Joseph of Arimathea. He'd had this tomb made for his burial. But the body of Jesus was put into Joseph of Arimathea's tomb and it laid there for three days. The question is, where was Jesus during those three days? He was in Hades, which really means the place of departed spirits. There were two compartments in Hades, one for those of the righteous dead, the Old Testament saints, the righteous who had believed. The Bible says they called that place Abraham's bosom or paradise. Remember what Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. It was below into the lost parts of the earth. The other compartment was a compartment where there was torment. Absolute torment. Last week, Steve spoke about the ascension. The Bible says, He who ascended, first of all, descended into the low parts of the earth. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. His flesh was put to death on the cross. But his Spirit was alive. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Here, when Christ departed, his spirit departed, the Bible says he went to the lost parts of the earth. And Peter tells us some of the things that he did there. He preached to the spirits, the demon spirits, the spirits that had been instrumental for all the havoc and the chaos that was caused prior to the flood coming in the days of Noah. The evil, the wickedness that was upon the face of the earth. These demon spirits were responsible for it. And they'd been there in that place of torment. Spirits, demon spirits. And the word of God says Jesus went and he preached to the spirits who were in prison. Those who had formerly been disobedient in the days of Noah. What did he preach to them? He preached his victory. He preached his triumph. He preached his conquest. Hallelujah. Friends, I believe too that he also declared to the righteous in that place of bliss, I'm the one that you've been waiting for. 
I'm the one that you've looked for down the centuries. I am he. Hallelujah. And he declared to them the resurrection. The Bible says that on the third day, he rose again. What a miracle that was. When his spirit came back into his body, as it lay on that tomb, that slab, his spirit that had been in Hades for three days, came back to his body. And the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ took place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Friends, we believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those grave clothes that he'd been wrapped in, they were just left empty. Somebody said the stone wasn't rolled away to let us in. Or wasn't rolled away to let him out. It was rolled away to let us in. To see that he's risen indeed. When Peter saw the grave clothes... And when he saw the napkin that had been about his head laid in a place by itself, he believed. Amen. Hallelujah. The resurrection took place. And Christ rose again from the dead. And the Bible says he became the first fruits of all who slept. He appeared to Mary on that first morning of his resurrection. She thought it was the gardener. And what did he say to her? Mary. And she knew who it was. And she wanted to fall at his feet and touch him. And he said, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my father. Don't touch me, Mary. I have not yet ascended. On the night, the doors were closed. And the disciples were in that room. And the doors, the Bible says, had been locked because of fear of the Jews. And as they were sitting, talking, suddenly, they were aware of a presence. And he was there before them. Hallelujah. He was there. And they were terrified. They thought it was a ghost. What did Jesus say? Handle me. And see. Hallelujah. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like I have. Mary, don't touch me. The night, touch me. I want to tell you, friends, during that first resurrection morning and during that day, he had ascended to the Father. Hallelujah. He had gone back home and he'd gone back in triumph. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be you lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord. He is the King of glory. Strong and mighty in battle. Hallelujah. Friends, when he went in triumph back into heaven, he didn't go alone. He emptied paradise. He emptied paradise. He emptied that place of the righteous. And the Bible says he led those who had been captive in that place, he led them cap in, out of captivity into the very presence of God himself. Hallelujah. And so now for the believer, when we die, we are not going to paradise. We are going to heaven. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. The first heaven is the earth's atmosphere. The second heaven is outer space, the galaxy. The third heaven is where the throne of God is. And Paul, the Bible says, you know he was stoned to death at Lystra. And they, 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 everybody thought he was dead. He was dead. I really believe he was dead. And something happened when his spirit departed his body. He says, I was caught up into the third heaven. And I heard and I saw those things, saw things there that I've not been able to tell anybody about. This is 14 years later he's saying this. He'd never opened his mouth about it until 14 years later. And he felt 
that he was obliged now that he could tell people, I was caught up into the third heaven. I heard and I saw things there. Friends, what did he see? He saw the glorious kingdom. Hallelujah. No wonder he, didn't, he, did, he wanted to go. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. He said, it's ne- it's, he said, I want to go to be with Christ. Which is far better. It's far better than all this. But it's necessary. I know it's needful. You need me amongst you for a little while. But I really want to go. The Bible says when we are absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. Hallelujah. One day, friends, our spirits will leave our body. The good thing is, you're not going to die. Do you know it's impossible for you to die? Impossible. You'll never die. All that will die is your body. You'll be as much alive as you ever were. People sometimes call that, what is it, out of the body experiences. It's when the spirit leaves the body. We'll be as much alive as we are. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that lives and believes in me. Do you live and believe in him? Even though he may die, yet shall he live. And listen to this, staggering. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Hallelujah. You are never, ever going to die. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I haven't got a clue where I'm at, but never mind. (laughs) Prior to leaving Hades, I want you to see something here, friends. He broke the power of death that Satan had held upon mankind. That's why Paul writes, death, where is your sting? Grave, where's your victory? Up until the cross, the sting of death was sin. Thank God at the cross, he took the sting out of it. Hallelujah. His victory over death has now become our victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. When, when, he, when John saw him on the Isle of Patmos, he said, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am he that lives. And I was dead. But behold, I'm alive forevermore. Isn't that wonderful? But then he went on, and I have the keys of death and of hell. I've got the keys of Hades. Hallelujah. Those keys represented the authority. When you had keys in those times, it represented authority. Thank God, friends, he has the keys of death and of hell, of Hades. All authority, all power is being given to him. And God, the Lord didn't only have victory in life. He had victory in death. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The power of sin is now destroyed. The power of death is now destroyed. Don't don't get me wrong. It's still an enemy. It says the last great enemy. The last enemy that we'll ever face is death. But for the child of God, we know. Hallelujah. 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 He destroyed Hebrews 2.14. He destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the devil. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, we celebrate your victory. We celebrate your victory this morning. We triumph in your love. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. No longer to be subject to a yoke of slavery. Lord, I pray this morning for every besetting sin. I pray this morning, Lord, for all the flesh areas of our lives that we battle with. That, Lord, up until this time, Lord, have got us under their feet. 
I pray for every sickness, oh God, that, Lord, plagues the people of God. God, I pray for every, everything, Lord, in, in the realm of depression that comes upon your people. Lord, it's a curse. And, Lord, you became a curse for us. Lord, that you might redeem us. And I pray this morning, Lord, freedom in Jesus' name. I pray victory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Friends, proclaim it over your life. You know what you battle with. You know what, for you, what torments you. You claim the victory of Christ. You don't have to fight for it. You've just got to make it your own. Hallelujah. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us if God be, is, is for us? What a Savior we serve. A victorious, conquering Savior who breaks every chain and gives us the victory again and again. Hallelujah. Lord, help us to walk in the victory that you have appropriated for us on the cross, that you have done for us, O oh God. Lord, you did it all for us that we might live in complete and utter freedom from the tyranny of sin, the flesh, and the devil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be unto God who gives Cliff Henderson the victory. Hallelujah. Who gives Kevin Brownlee the victory. Who gives Colin Angel the victory. Who gives Luke Taylor the victory. Who gives Steve Young the victory. Who gives you the victory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Jesus, this morning. Praise you, Jesus, this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.